people and you say, ah, oh, they talked about power. You follow me? Now, they talked about jelly bean too, but they only talked about it maybe one time. So that's not important. And that's called natural language processing. And so as we were sitting before the Lord, it occurred to me that God uses natural language processing. When we sit before God, or when you're in your individual closet, if the Father keeps speaking something to you, that's important, isn't it? See, that's what the world's latched on to. They've latched on to that if you're having a conversation and this word keeps coming out, that means it's powerful. So let's, let's talk about the application real quick. So if you're meeting with 10 customers and you're wanting to get feedback on your product, and you keep hearing a key word, what would, what would be the wisest thing for you to do as the owner of your product? Go back. Go dig deeper, right? Why, what is it about that uh, softness that you liked? What is it? Why did I keep hearing the word softness? Why did I keep hearing the word uh, uh, laziness? Why did I keep hearing the word, right? And so that's important. So as we were sitting before the Lord, it just came to me that if we took the word, the most important, the one that kept coming out as we sat before the Lord, what do you think that is? Well, what, what word? What specific word? Praise kept coming up, didn't it? What else? Shepherd kept coming up. Sheep. Shepherd, sheep, you could lump them together. All I'm asking you to start thinking about when you sit alone in your prayer closet and the word keeps coming up two, three, four times, don't ignore it. When we sit before the Lord and there's two, three, four words that keep coming up, the Father is sending us a message. He wants us to remember Here's what I'm asking you to do. Here's what I'm reminding you of, right? And so keep focused on those things that he keeps reminding us. See, wouldn't it be interesting if he gives us 10 times he keeps speaking this word and he speaks jelly beans over here and somebody says, I wonder why he spoke jelly beans. Not even focused on the 10 things that are the 10 times he spoke this word. Do you think this word's important over here? Yeah, and so all I think the reason he had me to remember that was because that he wants us to keep focusing on what he's telling us to do. It doesn't mean the other things aren't important, but if he keeps saying it, it's important. Salvation was another word. Today is the day of salvation, right? Okay, so keep that in mind. All right, Chad, why don't you come? Give Chad a warm welcome. That's probably the last time you're going to hear jelly beans in the service. I don't plan on talking about it anymore. Um, so what the Lord had placed on my heart this morning, uh, and I'm going to do this as a, a five-minute golden nugget. It's probably going to turn a little bit longer than five minutes. Uh, but it was a revelation that he gave me many years ago, and he gave it to me this morning. And then when I talked to Joe before service, and he said, hey, can you do something, cover something on the memory scriptures? And I'm like... Okay, and as I met with Mike, he's like, hey, this flows right together. So, and then I, I saw it, it just kind of all came together. So, many years ago, the Lord had given me this revelation about the beginning of ministries and how uh, specifically with Jesus, Paul, and Peter, they were all baptized, they were all filled with the Spirit before they actually got up and gave their first sermon, or they started teaching people. The Lord wanted them to be filled with His Spirit before they did that. So I'm going to go into some of these scriptures for each of these people, and I'm going to bring this all full circle, uh, so just hang with me. This was, again, a revelation from many years ago he gave me, but then he started adding to it this morning. So Jesus specifically, we can see in Luke 3, 21 through 23, that John the Baptist is baptizing him. Uh, he is filled with the Spirit here. Now, immediately after this is when he's led by the Spirit to go into the wilderness to be tempted by the enemy. In verses 13 through 15, after all of this temptation has occurred, 
It says, now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until a more opportune time. Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went out through all the surrounding region. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. This is the first time in Scripture it actually references Jesus' teaching. Again, it's after he is filled with the Spirit. So God wanted him to be filled with the Spirit before he went out teaching. You can actually read before in Luke chapter 2, it's talking about Jesus growing up, and it's, it's talking about his mother and father looking for him when he's 12 years old. He's gone for three days. They're like, where is he at? And well, he was in the temple. He was listening to the people, listening to them. He was learning, and he was asking them questions. Uh, so he wasn't teaching yet. He's filled with the Spirit, and then he starts teaching. We can see the same thing with Paul. If you read in Acts chapter 9, Paul's living a life of sin. He's doing things he shouldn't be doing. Uh, and then he ultimately, he's blinded. And the Lord speaks to Ananias and says, hey, you need to go and pray for Paul. And as he prays for him, uh, I'll just read this. Ananias went this way, entered into the house, laying his hands on him. He said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. So we can see with Jesus and with, with Paul, once they're filled with the Spirit, God now sends them out to go and teach and preach. Now with Peter going to share a little background here. So Jesus had told all the disciples in Luke 24, 49, behold, I send the promise of the Father upon you. Tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Now, they probably didn't know fully what that meant, but Jesus is saying, you need to go and wait here. Wait until you receive the power. Tarry there. He didn't tell them to, hey, just go wait a few days and then leave. He said, wait until you get the power. Acts 5.32, this is a scripture I, I've always kind of stood upon with the Holy Spirit and talking to people with the Holy Spirit. I think the Lord had showed Hannah this one first, but we are his witnesses to these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. So as we know what God's word says, as we obey what God's word says, that now opens the door for God to send his Holy Spirit to us, but we have to obey him first. We have to obey what his word tells us. So if you're walking in disobedience to anything that the word says and you're praying for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you're probably not going to get it because according to what the word says, he gives his Holy Spirit to those who obey him, who obey his word. So those disciples who went and tarried in the upper room and they didn't leave from there, they got filled with the Spirit. Those that went to the upper room and said, We've been here eight days. This is crazy. I'm getting out of here. They weren't filled. We've got to obey what he tells us to do in order to receive that baptism. So as they did this, as they tarried in the upper room, this is what you're seeing in Acts chapter 1, chapter 2. Uh, it comes in like a rushing mighty wind. Then they start praying in tongues. And you can see in Acts 2.14, as all of this happens, and some people on the outside are like, these people are crazy. They're drunk. What is going on? That's when Peter stands up and gives his first sermon. Once he's filled with the Spirit. Peter references this later on, years later in Acts 11. He said, and as I, Peter, began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as it fell upon us at the beginning. At Pentecost is what the Amplified says. Peter's referencing the beginning of his ministry to that one point in time when he got filled with the Spirit, because that's when the Lord started using him to preach and to teach others. So, part two of this, the end of Peter's teaching in Acts chapter 2, starts in verse 38. It says, Then Peter said to them, Repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children, and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord God will call. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word 
were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. So as Peter was filled with the Spirit, he stood up, he started preaching. This is how it ended. About 3,000 souls were saved that day. When you look at the, the word for ministry, and the original Greek word for ministry, it's diakonia. And, and when I looked this up many years ago, uh, and I used Bible Hub to look at what the meanings of these words mean and the original intended meaning of the word that's used for ministry in Scripture, diakonia, the second definition here says specifically refers to spirit-empowered service guided by faith. True ministry, true ministry should be empowered by the Holy Spirit of God, guided by faith, which according to Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So ministry should be empowered by the Holy Spirit, but guided by his word. We're not lifting the Holy Spirit above the word. Psalm 138, 2, he lifts his word above his name, and the word has to be primary, uh, and the Holy Spirit, you can see, uses the word. It's guided by the word or faith. So what should a church service look like? Uh, And this is part of the revelation that he was kind of adding to uh, what I had gotten previously, that every ministry, every person that teached and preached in the word, truly led by God, they were filled with the Spirit first. Well, when we, we look at when church comes together, when we come together as a church, this is what we can see in 1 Corinthians 14. And we, we share this verse all the time when we're talking about sitting before the Lord. Uh, even in teaching, we pass the mic. What then is the right course, believers? When you meet together, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, a disclosure of special knowledge, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let everything be constructive and edifying and done for the good of all the church. So when we come together, it's not for one person to get up here and just, I'm just going to preach a message that, that I've gotten out of the Word of God. No, it's for the edification of the church body, and you can see that in these other verses as well. For in this way, you can all prophesy one by one so that everyone may be instructed and everyone may be encouraged. And then verse uh, 33, for God, who is the source of their prophesying, is not a God of confusion and disorder, but of peace and order, as is the practice in all the churches of the saints of God's people. That's what God's design is, is that we are orderly, that we are in peace. And we've got a lot of churches that are just, I'm going to go from a message, I've got an agenda, I'm going to do this. But God wants everyone that stands in the pulpit, everyone that goes up on stage, everyone that's to deliver a message to be led by the Holy Spirit. Not that it's a requirement that you need to be led by the Spirit to teach someone, but so that the needs of the people can be met. They can be encouraged. They can be edified. And I think we can all probably attest to when we have been to a church service and we left and it's like, that word was for me today. I mean, we can probably all say that. I looked it up. Does anyone know how many actual scriptures, verses there are in the Bible? Yeah, you're right there at it. 31,102. 31,000. Oh, people are going to get me because I'm a math person. But 31,102. That's how many scriptures there are in the Bible. If you go to church twice a week, it's 52 weeks in a year, just let's say 100, we can move the decimal place over to. If you went to church 100 times in a year, it would take you 311 years to get every single verse in the Bible, if you heard a verse every week, 311 years. But we can probably all say, I've been to church many times, and I left, and like, that was the word I needed today. That's exactly what I, ne- I needed. He was speaking to me. That's the power of the Holy Spirit leading the, the, the pastors, the teachers, whoever it is that's up here to say, hey, Julie has a need, Wayne has a need, Bruce has a need, whoever it is. And if we have our own agenda, we can completely miss that. And now people leave church and they don't have their needs met. They, they leave 
in more confusion. What is going on? And we can even see that with Jesus when he was 12 years old going into the temple and asking questions. If you have a question, if something's not making sense, ask it. It's not that it's a dumb question. There might be three other people that have that same question like, what is this? Why is this happening? Ask the question so, so those needs can be met. You know, we'll have a plan. Joe has a plan every single time that he gets up here, but the Lord can go whichever way is needed to help that person or help you or help somebody else. And that's the importance of being led by the Spirit. And as Joe was talking, you know, right before I came up here, those, those words that kept coming up about praise and shepherding or whatever it is, that's a message that the Holy Spirit is delivering to the church to meet the needs of somebody because that's a need today. It wasn't what Joe was planning. This isn't what I was planning today, but that's the power of the Holy Spirit and the importance of us being led by the Spirit to make sure that people don't leave this place in lack, that they don't leave this place being overcome by the enemy. We're called to be overcomers, and God's given us everything that we need to overcome. So uh, the importance of being led by the Spirit. So as I was putting this together this morning, just a couple hours ago, uh, and as Mike was looking at it, the memory scripture that, that Brian had, Psalm 118, 8 and 9, it's better to trust in the Lord than to put your confidence in man. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put your confidence in princes. Same applies to teaching at a church or, or doing a Bible study with someone, your coworker, or whoever it is. Be led of the Spirit. If you're doing discipleship with someone, take it before the Lord. And if the Lord tells you, okay, we're teaching on humility tonight, we're on that lesson, but the Lord speaks to you before that and said, no, you need to address lust, or no, you need to address unforgiveness. Do that. That's the Holy Spirit saying, this is what that person needs. Put your trust in the Lord and not in man to have this agenda. Not saying throw the agenda out, but if the Lord tells you to do something differently, do something differently. And then James 3, 17 and 18, this was Ben's scripture, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. So when the Holy Spirit gives us that direction, that's wisdom coming from heaven saying, this is what this person needs. And we may not even know who that person is, but it's for somebody. If God's telling us to go that direction, somebody needs it. And that's the wisdom from heaven. Again, not putting our trust in man. And then Mike's scripture, John 15, 9 through 10, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. God loves you. God loves me. He doesn't want any of us to be hurting or in lack or sickness or disease or whatever it is. He doesn't want us being confused. He wants order. He wants peace. He wants love and he wants righteousness. God loves each and every one of us, and that's why he wants somebody that's led of his spirit to be teaching you. So if you do have a need, it can be brought out in that service. So being filled with the spirit. If you're not filled with the spirit, I, I covered these two verses earlier. Do what God's word says, first and foremost. Get into his word, and as you read it, obey it, do what it says. So we are his witnesses to these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. And then as Peter said in Acts 2, 38 and 39, it didn't go away with the disciples. It's to you, it's to your children, to all those who are far off. Uh, it's still, still here today. And then John 14, 15 through 17, if you love me, keep my commandments. This is what Jesus said again, talking about that obedience. If you love me, keep my commandments. And this is a cause and effect thing. If you keep my commandments, what does Jesus do? I will pray to the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you, and he will be in you. So the Holy Spirit can be with you. You can, you can sense the power of the Holy Spirit. He can be there, but there's an even greater power of him being in you. 
And then Luke 11, 9 through 13. Joe has been talking about the unjust judge a lot in, in Luke 18, talking about the perseverance. And I just pulled this up in the Amplified. It says, So I say to you, ask and keep on asking, and it will be given to you. Seek and keep on seeking, and you will find. Knock and keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who keeps on asking persistently receives, and he who keeps on seeking persistently finds, and to him who keeps on knocking persistently, the door will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, that is sinful by nature, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask and continue to ask him. So if you haven't been filled with the Spirit, get in his word, do what the word says, and then just keep asking him for it. Keep asking, be persistent, be persistent, keep on, keep on, keep on. So that's my, I don't know what time I came up here, but that's my 15-minute golden nugget revelation. Oh, does Paul have a comment? When you first wrote that number up, for whatever reason, my mind just added it together, and it equals seven, which is completion. So, Yeah, I apologize for the math, but, yeah, if you're dividing anything by 100, just move it two decimal places. Uh, for those of you who are kids, pay attention to math. You use it every single day. Um, if you're asking me about another subject, don't ask me. Ask somebody else. Um, find somebody else that's a science major, history major, but uh, pay attention to math. You'll use it. Um, so be filled with the Spirit. God used the people in the Bible that were led of His Spirit, that have been filled with His Spirit to teach others, and that's because God loves everyone, and He wants to make sure their needs are met. So uh, just encourage you uh, in that, that God loves every one of you, and He wants us all to be filled with His Spirit. So with that, I'll give it over to Joe. And stay up here for a minute, Chad. So <clears throat> I can just imagine somebody were streaming and somebody asking in here or somebody asking online. Because it's always interesting when we use Acts 532. And in fact, Chad, Mike, would you put that back up? And when we talk about, you know, we have to obey what we know. And that's so important. But I can also imagine people saying, well, I do everything that God's called me to do, and I'm still not baptized in the Holy Ghost. Does God lie? No, no he doesn't. He means what he says. Okay, so let's, let's talk a little bit about this. What are some of those things you think that God could be talking about? Because when I come to the Lord and I say, Lord, baptize me in the Holy Ghost, it seems like I would have a clean heart. But what are some of the things that maybe could be going on in my life that I have not really yielded over to the Lord? Yeah, uh, all those things that, that you've held from your previous life. You know, God calls us to be a new creation. So uh, if you're still going out with your old friends, cussing and drinking and, and watching all these things that you shouldn't be watching and doing all these things that you shouldn't be doing, not being faithful to your spouse or uh, being angry or uh, not forgiving your loved ones when they've done something to you or not forgiving the people that you work with or just not being the light to those people, being a bad influence and not sharing the love of Christ to them uh, and endorsing the grumbling and complaining and negative attitudes. And uh, I mean, there's so many things, but as the Lord... Uh, I, I know the Lord with me is taking it one step at a time. The Lord will, will say, hey, this is what you need to work on. You need to get rid of this. And as you do that, he doesn't bombard us. He doesn't say, okay, here's a list of a thousand things. You need to fix every single one of these things because it would overwhelm every single one of us. But he will say, you need to correct this. And once you deal with that area of your life, now you move up a step, and now he says, okay, now you need to correct this, and then now you need to correct this. Now, in some situations, there might be some really grotesque things, and he says, you need to get rid of all of that, but uh, the Lord will take you one step at a time to say, uh, you need to deal with these things. Could seeking my self-interest? Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's really what happened to me, part of it, 
Uh, what about believing I mean, a lie? What, that's what Jesus was doing at 12 years old when, when Mary and Joseph came and found him in the temple. And he's like, where have you been? We've been looking for you for three days. And he said, don't you know I'm about my father's business? It's okay, yeah. calm down. That's, I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm doing, doing what my father's told me to do. And that's, yeah. that's where we've all got to be. So what about believing a lie? So, yeah, for example, that's where we've got to get into the word so the Holy Spirit can give us revelation that, hey, what you've been standing on over here isn't, isn't true. It's, yeah, you know, that's where you got to get into the word each and every day. And the Lord will reveal those things to you. Yeah. So to that, be careful what you're reading. Right. For six years, I didn't believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost because I believed what somebody told me. You may be reading all these articles on the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And they may tell you to do it this way or this way. Throw those things out. And you go to the Word of God and you stand on the scriptures that Chad covered with us this morning. Right? And you stand on God's Word. Father, you said that if I have a clean heart, if I don't have any sin in me, you'd baptize me in the Holy Ghost. Father, show me if there's any sin in me. If I've believed a lie, if I'm seeking self-interest, maybe I want to be baptized in the Holy Ghost because I want to speak in tongue. That's not your reason to do it, right? Your reason to be baptized in the Holy Ghost is so that you can live for God, right? Not to fit in with the church that you're going to. And so what is your motive? Because God doesn't lie. And that's what you and I need to realize. And grumbling and complaining. Even, you know what, I've been seeking God for six years, and I haven't gotten baptized yet. Does that sound like grumbling and complaining? Yeah. That's between you and God. But God will fill a clean vessel. Here's what you have to realize. Is the Holy Spirit holy? That's why they call him the Holy Spirit, isn't it? Okay, do you think if you're grumbling or complaining that your temple is holy? Uh Uh-uh. Do you think if you're believing a lie, if your temple is holy? No, it's not. See, the temple has to be holy for the Holy Ghost to come in. And so all he's asking us to do is just submit ourselves unto him. Get in his word. Stand upon his word. Don't stand on it because Chad said, because Joe said, because Brother Hagin said. You follow me? See, we begin to believe people above the word of God. Those people might be in line with the Word, but you're still not to believe them. You're to believe what the Word says. And so, what are some other things? Anything on your mind, Chad, or any, from anyone else? Ah. Uh-uh. I want the Holy Ghost, and I want it now. Right? Yeah. See, what is that? You, not only are you being impatient... But you haven't sought him to see if there's something else keeping you back. See, learn to rest in the Lord. Rest in him. Rest in his promises. Is he going to baptize you in the Holy Ghost? Is that what he promises? Yes. Yes. He has stipulations with it, doesn't he? So don't, don't feel less of a child of God. Don't feel any more of a child of God if you're baptized. Just walk in obedience. And if somebody asks you, are you baptized in the Holy Ghost? You can say, well, I didn't know there was a Holy Ghost, one. And if you didn't, find out about the Holy Ghost. Or you can say, yes, I've been baptized in the Holy Ghost. Another one could be, you know what? I'm standing on God's Word. I'm waiting on God to baptize me, period. Don't say anything else. Don't say, I've been waiting for blah, blah, blah. Don't say that, you know what? I don't know what's going on. No, just say, I'm trusting God to baptize me in the Holy Ghost. That's our answer, right? Anything else? Chad, anything from your perspective? I just wanted to say no condemnation if you haven't because, I mean, we've all been there. That's right. We've all been to a point where we were saved and we didn't, we weren't baptized, so no condemnation if you are there. Uh, The other ones that came out were uh, unforgiveness or bitterness if you're holding any kind of bitterness in your heart. Communing with the wrong crowd, 1 Corinthians 15, 33, bad company corrupts good morals. If you're still with that crowd that's not walking with the Lord, you know, light can't have fellowship with darkness. What you're watching, what you're listening to. Would unworthiness be another person not thinking that they're worthy to receive? 
yeah, you're not believing God that you're going to get it. So, yeah, you're doubting. You don't have the faith to believe God and his promise. Fear, yes. Yeah, for sure. And forgiveness not just for others, but for yourself as well. Definitely. Yes. Yeah, that's good. That was me. I was driving home from church one night, and uh, the Lord gave me a vision that I was parked in a parking lot, and I'm like, well, that's strange. I guess I need to go over there. And I, I drove there, and then boom, there it was. So, Praise yeah. God. Do, do you see, what, what is God saying to us? Let's use natural language processing. What's he saying? Be filled. Be filled. Yes. Yeah, and, don't, and if any of these fit, then wear it and get rid of it, right? Ownership, and then get rid of it. And to Chad's point, too, is, guys, we're not here to judge one another. If a person has been filled, pray for them. Don't, don't, don't say, well, I don't know why she's not. I don't know why he's not. Well, I think I know why he's not, right? That's not your job. You're not a judge. And it's only the word of God is our judge, right? And so make sure that we're not doing that to one another, that we're praying for one another. Okay, because see, now here's the other side of this. Let's say that I've been seeking and I've been seeking and I haven't, I haven't gotten baptized. What does the devil begin to tell me now? Never will. It's not real. You're not worthy, right? All of that is a lie from the pit of hell because he doesn't want you to be baptized. It's what Chad was talking about with the power of the Holy Spirit upon us because for whatever reason, when he comes upon us, he gives us power, right? He gives us, he helps us to understand the will of God. He's, he is our teacher. He's with us, but he wants to be in us. And so don't, don't believe any of the lies of the enemy. Just examine ourselves, make sure we're, we're walking where we should, and then do what he needs, and then do what we need to do. Amen? Out of one more, uh, Proverbs fourteen thirty was coming to me. A calm and undisturbed heart and mind are the life and health of the body. So, stress, worry, anxiety, uh, all of those things also is things that God never intended for us to carry. And you know, He tells us that we need to cast all of our cares upon Him. So, if you're carrying those things, you don't have a calm and undisturbed heart and mind. You're not clear to just freely focus on Him and what He's called you to do. Your your mind's elsewhere, and you need to give that to Him. Yeah. Yes, amen. And see, okay, when we start listening, this is big, isn't it? And, and we need to examine ourselves. Now, l let's take one step further. Just because you've been baptized in the Holy Ghost, these things can keep you from moving in the Holy Ghost, right? Okay, Julie? So I used to think that you had to go down and have lay hands laid on you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I did do that, but I was praying and reading the Bible when I got mine a few months later. So it, it doesn't have to come like that. That's right. That's right. And see, so, so there's a mindset, isn't there? Okay. So even a mindset that it has to be a certain way. I have to go to the church this morning and do it. No, if the Holy Spirit told you, go do it. Like Chad, right? Go over there to that parking lot. But if he didn't tell you, be careful of having a mindset yeah, as to how he's going to do it. I know one person that was sitting on the toilet when they got filled, so I mean, yeah. the Lord can use it in any way. Carrie? <laughs> 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 so also, um, like Julie said, it's like Julie okay, Carrie. said, you can... Um, have someone lay hands on you, but that could go in a negative way if someone, if they're laying hands on you and they're not truly walking where they're supposed to be, or the fact that you're putting your trust in the hands that were laid on you instead of the Holy Spirit. That's right. 
So that could go that one. I was just going to throw something else out with um, believing a lie. When I grew up, I won't say the type of religion, but the type of religion. My grandmother, I really looked up to her. And she always told me, she's like, oh, that, that is of the devil. And so I was told that as a small child. And so that's what I had believed. And I wondered, why, well, why is it in the Bible if it's of the devil? And so believing a lie can be, if you're told something from a family member of someone you look up to, that could also hamper because you had trust or you, you know, trusted that person and what they said. Yes, that's good. Yeah, Mike, would you pull up Ephesians 5.18? And Brian, do you have any comment? The, uh, the circumstances and situations you're bringing up goes along with my memory scripture. You know, it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Um, it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. You know, a prince nowadays doesn't have to be like a Solomon. We make princes out of people. Yeah. We make, you know, idols out of people, especially with this social media generation. And I think the message is be careful where you're getting your information from. Because it may or may not line up with the Word of God, you know, and there's a lot of false teaching out there, a lot of false doctrine, and the enemy wants nothing more to come and steal that Word out of your heart. But if you just focus on the Scriptures and meditate on those, you know, the Holy Spirit who's with you will give you revelation about the baptism and the infilling. You know, seek and you'll find. Ask and it shall be given unto you. So that's what's key is to drown out all the noise, you know, push that away and really just meditate on the Word of God and you'll be filled. Amen. Yes. And that is for every one of us in every situation, but specifically as it relates to the baptism, go to the Word, see what the Word says, stand upon the Word of God. God wants to baptize us with the Holy Ghost because you and I need Him. We need His leadership, His guidance, His teacher, ability, right? And so we need, him, we need to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. And the enemy wants nothing more than you not to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. And I think when we look at all of this here, we begin to say, wow, the enemy can try to use a lot of stuff against us. But if you, will, if you and I will stay in the Word of God, this won't matter. Just stay in the Word of God. Look, do, do a scripture search. Look at every scripture on the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And the, Mike, if you'll pull that up now, Ephesians 5.18... See, do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. That actually came out as we set before the Father. And so what you and I want to look at are what are the commands in Scripture? There are, let me just put this up here real quick. Well, as you're doing that, Mike, can you go back to the verse right before that? Ephesians 5, 17. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. I think it's just so key to point that out, that God is saying, this is the will of the Lord, that you not be drunk with wine, but that you be filled with the Spirit. That is the will of God for your life. Amen. Thank you, Chad. Rightly dividing the word. Um, so there are commands in scriptures, and there are examples. Many times we take examples and make them commands. Okay, and, ex and experience, you could say experience, but this being in the Word and written, it's they've gone before us. Now, those examples are good. We're not throwing them out because Romans 15, 4 says these things were written for our example, right? However, don't be, do be careful about making an example a command. Let me give you an example. The example is... They laid hands on people. Paul laid hands. Peter laid hands on people. They were healed. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. Those are examples. The command in the Scripture is for you and I to be filled with the Holy Ghost, be filled with the Spirit. The example is these are the ways they were done. But don't ever pick an example and say, I want that. Right? What you want is the command. I will be filled with the Holy Ghost. However God chooses to do it, I will be filled with the Holy Ghost. And that's what you and I have to focus on, okay? We can do this with everything in the Scripture. And you always want to separate what's an example versus what is a command, okay? 
Any other thoughts? Yeah, I was just going to say Jesus was baptized in water when he got filled with the Spirit. So, I mean, in everything, what I try to do is don't put God in a box. Don't expect it to happen a certain way because God can do it any way he wants to. And just believe that it's going to happen. He didn't say how it's going to happen. He just said it will happen. Amen. And just trust him and don't tell him how to do his job. Yes. Let him do it. Absolutely. All right. Any last thoughts on the baptism? of the Holy Ghost, or any, anything that we've talked about thus far. Okay? Can we get the mic to Bruce? I know this is so simple and it's short, but you got to be obedient. All of God's work is done in truth. Yeah, oh, thank you. So let's do Psalm 33, 4. If we could pull it up real quick. That... It goes back, and this was one of Brian's memory scriptures back months ago. Uh, God does all of his work in truth, right? And guys, I don't know if that's revelational to you, but it should be. Because he does all of his work in his word, right? So the word of the Lord is right, and all his work is done in truth. That's where he does his work. And so that's why you and I need to be in the word daily. That's why you and I need to be hiding the word in our heart. Uh, and letting God work. Wayne? It really is amazing after I was baptized in the Holy Ghost how the Word of God came alive to me. Yeah. It, it became a person to me. And, yes. And now it never gets old. I can read the same Word over and over again, and it's always a new revelation. Amen. Amen. But the Holy Spirit is one that shows us into all truth. Amen. Thank you. Yeah, and let's just go, because I believe all of this is connected. If we could, and I... <laughs> Lord willing, if it be the Lord's will, we're going to find a way to do this. Because I think every service, God has a message. And it's not that he doesn't have sub-messages. He does. But there's a main message that God wants us to walk away with. And I think this morning, part of it is dealing with the Holy Spirit. And that if you and I, because I'm reminded of what the Lord showed me as we sat before the Lord. And I'll tell you what I saw. This, this was a corral or a shepherd's pen, call it whatever. But the shepherd was here and guarding the gate, and there was only one sheep in the... That doesn't look like a sheep. <laughs> There's a sheep. <laughs> Not really, but anyway... Uh, there was one sheep in the pen. And what I saw was the pen used to be full, but all of these sheep went out and they were following other people. You hear what I'm saying? They were distracted. They heard this message and this message and this message and this message and this message. That goes along with what Jesus said in Matthew 24. In the last day, many false prophets would arise, right? In fact, would you pull that up, Chad? Matthew 24. And so, there was one sheep that was left. And you know what that one sheep was doing? Focused on the Word. And they were listening to the Father's voice. And that's what you and I are going to have to do. If we don't, you won't, you won't be in that pen. You'll be out here with all the others floundering around, Chasing after all the stuff, and you don't want to be there. I don't want to be there. Yes. Yeah. That's right. All of this stuff. Yes. Now, l let me clarify. Are there some good teachings on YouTube? Yes, there is. Here's what I would encourage you to do. Always go to the Word of God as number one. Go to the Word of God daily to seek the truth. If the Father leads you to another teaching, that's okay. But you let the Word of God be your, be your mainstay, right? Because if you don't, you will get distracted. You will be misled. Tossed here and there to every, every form of doctrine. So be careful. Okay, let's go to Matthew 24. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. 
And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Now, that is powerful right there. Why does, people, why does love grow cold? Because lawlessness, right? You hear on the news, you can't open your door, okay? Don't talk to people when you go out. People are trying to get your information, okay? So you're not going to talk to people. You're not going to share the love of God with them because you're afraid, right? So love will grow cold. You won't be trusting God. And see, you and I have got to learn to trust God no matter what the condition in the world looks like. Now, if you and I are listening to the voice of the Lord, He will warn you if there's any danger, right? When He warns you, listen to what He's telling you. If He says, don't go there, don't go there. But unless He tells you, you demonstrate the love of God, right? And that love is demonstrated through the fruit of the Spirit. And remember, Primarily, the fruit of the Spirit is patience and uh, kindness and gentleness and goodness. That's how God's love is demonstrated to the world, right? You say, well, I'm going to love the world. Well, if you're impatient, you're not loving the world. If you're impatient and, or excuse me, you're not kind, you're not loving them. And so you and I have got to demonstrate the, the fruit so that we truly can demonstrate love. Because you say you're loving and you're not this, you're lying to yourself. So you got to do this to demonstrate love, right? Okay, so love will grow cold uh, because of lawlessness. Okay, next. But he who endures to the end will be saved. Now, let's dice this. Let's, let's cut it up in many ways that we can. Because I don't think he really means endure to the end. I think he must be talking about something else. What do you think? You think he's talking about doing the word? Yeah, I think he is too. You see, there are those who will tell you, well, he's talking about persecution. That if you, if you can, if you... Um, because the world's getting so bad that he's talking just about persecution. He's not talking about anything else because, you know, salvation is in Jesus Christ. And it's Jesus who gets you to heaven. It's Jesus who gets you saved. It's your behaviors following Jesus that gets you to heaven. You follow? Because that's what Jesus is saying. He who endures to the end. He who continues to do what I taught him is the one who will be saved. In spite of the world of what's going on. That's what he's saying in Revelation 3.21. He who overcomes will I grant to sit with me on my Father's throne. He who continues to the end and overcomes will the one who will sit with me on my Father's throne. And so realize that you and I have got a lot of work to do, but it, inch by inch, it's a cinch, right? If we just live one day at a time. Doing the word that we know today. And if we do, we're safe and we're secure. Right? Amen. In fact, we'll, let's go to Matthew 6. And we'll start at 33, Chad. I think, I think there's a couple verses after 33. Just one? Okay. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you, or added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. But what do you have to do today? Do the word, right? Tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So the only day that you and I really have to think about and worry about and not worry, but focus on, is today. Just make sure you and I do the Word of God today, period. Tomorrow morning when you get up, focus on that day, right? And the next day, focus on that day. Don't worry about the next day. And if you and I could start to live like that, we would have peace, the peace of God, the joy of the Lord. Chad? 
I just wanted to say uh, and chime in learning from you, sit down and, and plan your week out of this is what I'm going to do on Monday. This is what I'm going to do on Tuesday. This is what I'm going to do on Wednesday. Once you get to Monday, focus on what you had planned to do that day. Don't look ahead. Just focus on what you've planned to do that day. At the end of the day, if you said, okay, I only did four of the five things I was going to do, we'll shift that fifth thing to the next day and move it back and then just focus on those things. So you do need to take some time to plan yes. out the next week of what you are going to do each day. But then once that day comes, focus on what you've planned to do that day. Thank you for bringing balance to that. That is so true. Because what we're not saying is you don't have to plan. You need to plan. Why? Because scripture says, Proverbs 16, 9, man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps, right? Proverbs 16, 1 says that orderly thinking belongs to man. But the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. So you and I need to plan. We need to plan, Father, I'm going to sit down and plan my week. And so plan your week. And then as Chad's point, when you get to Monday, do Monday. If you need to take something from previous week and put, on, put it on there. But do what you've planned to do. And overall, you pray over that day, right? You say, Father, you know, here's my plan. But if you've got other plans for me, that's okay. You can do whatever you want to do with me this day. Amen? But don't fret. Don't worry. And, and for whatever reason, those, all of us, the, the ones who have children, just do what you know to do today with those children. If they're grown, if they're, not, if they're little, if they're babies, just do what you know to do today and pray over them and God will take care of them. Amen? Don't worry about what they're going to do 10 years from now, right? Don't worry about that. You're putting the right things in them. Trust God is going to work in them, right? He's going to, that's right, Proverbs 14, 30. It's a, pro, a common undisturbed heart and mind. It's the life and health of the body. And, and in that training, you want to train them to have a common undisturbed heart and mind. Trust God. Amen. Proverbs, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. In fact, would you pull that up, Chad? See, guys, that is a promise, but it's also a promise in reverse. Okay? Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Do you see the promise in reverse as well? If you don't train them up right, chances are they're not going to depart from it. Okay? Unless there's a supernatural event in their life. Now, when you, the survey, the latest, I won't say the latest, a recent survey of all the people who claim to be Christians, and they were asked, a, a sampling of those, they were asked, at what age did you come to know the Lord? 85% of them came before the age of 14. Only 15% came later. I came later, a few years later. But the thing is, chances are, once you train them up, they're going to come back to what they've been trained in. The reverse is true. That's why you want to make sure you're training them up in the ways of God. Amen? And if we haven't, we repent and we say, Father, forgive me, I didn't know the truth, and I ask you to somehow turn it around for good, and God will begin to turn it around for good. And we have the mic to Bruce. That comma, undisturbed heart and mind, or any other word of God, is you are setting an example for those children. And so while you are walking it out, they are seeing and responding. I mean, if it's bad or good, if it's unrighteousness or righteousness, you're teaching them. So you want to train yourself. As you're training yourself, God will work through you, through that word that's in you, and train them and help you train them prepare you for the future. If you remember concerning taking each day at a time, the manna, when the children of Israel wanted to take that manna and save some for tomorrow, it all went, I think it, 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 it rotted. It, yeah, it rotten out. And so it was a lack of faith on their part that God would trust them. After they've seen all those miracles, all those great things that God has done to deliver them from Egypt, they still 
went to back to their old ways and that was their doom. So, but as a parent, you know, as an individual, maintain yourself in the word, keep speaking it, and you will see those battles God win for you. And in those battles, you will receive confidence. But at any second, or not any second, but any day, you can walk away. God never walked from you, but you can walk away. That's how you have to be on guard. You set your mind on the word of God and be, and be on guard because the enemy is coming in, but you will be prepared to, to take on him through the word of God like a flood. Amen. Like a flood, that is. Amen. All right, any last comments before we close? All right, Mike, would you come? Amen. Thank you, Joe. This is a good day. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thinking of 1 Kings 8.61, it was a memory scripture last year I had. It says, but your hearts must be fully committed to the Lord our God to live by his decrees and obey his commands as at this time. And so our hearts have got to be somewhat committed, fully committed. Yeah. Thanks, Chad. Yeah. May your hearts be fully committed to the Lord our God to live by his decrees and obey his commands as at this time. Chad, can you go to Isaiah 3? I think it's 10 and 11. I'd read this earlier in the week. Let me verify. Yeah. So tell the righteous it will be well with them, for they will enjoy the fruit of their deeds. And so we can rest assured no matter what we're facing, right? It's going to go well, but we've got to have our hearts fully committed to doing his word. And I encourage us all, you know, if we've got any of this, in us, right? Rid yourself of it. How do I do that? Anybody? Find a scripture, right? Hide it in your heart and declare it. And every time that temptation comes up or every time that thought comes up that says, oh, you, this is the way you've always been. You weren't raised like this or you're believing a lie or you're impatient. You just declare and declare and declare. Amen. And keep declaring, right? I, I know I've shared this story. Um, I'll read verse 11 and then I'll share this story real fast. Woe to the wicked, Disaster is upon them. They will be paid back for what their hands have done. So it's not God putting it on us. It's his principle of sowing and reaping, right? And I love verse 10. Tell the righteous everything's going to be fine. But tell those who aren't, you know, aligning their lives with the Lord, with the word and removing these things, it's going to come and get us, right? And so uh, make sure we're doing all we know to do. So yeah, testimony of declaring and declaring. You know, I had a uh, situation at work. My boss told me to give an individual an assignment, and um, wasn't crazy about it, but I was the, the messenger, right? Got honor authority, and when I did, i never forget, this individual just, why have I got to do that? Why would I do this? Who told you this? Man, it just went from like zero to 100, the tension, you know, and your flesh. Well, because I told you, and he, my boss told me, so he's your boss too, right? And I just... I said, hey, this is, this is what he told us to do. I don't understand why I have to do this, and so I... I just walked off, and I hear this, you know, <laughs> I hear him hit the, hit the desk or the wall. Well, guess who I sat beside? <laughs> it's the wall to my office as well. And so I just sat there, and whoo, your flesh, right? You can feel the, the heat. <laughs> and uh, I got my battle card out. I have it on my desk, and I was like, where is it at, Lord? And it was, okay, Romans 12, 21. I will not be overcome by evil, but I overcome evil by doing good. I did this for probably five minutes. I'm, I'm sure if someone walked in my office, they'd be like, yeah, all right. Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> and, uh, but I did it, and I kept doing it. You know, I didn't do it. I will not be overcome. I didn't do it so he could hear me, right? <laughs> that would be the wrong motive. But I did it, and then finally what happened? This peace. <sighs> so then I prayed for him. I'm good, right? I'm good. And this is why we've got to be careful. I've shared this before. I used to have a passion for peace. And so if I had a passion for peace in that moment, what I would have done, I would have went over, hey, hey, can we talk about this? Can we work this out? Guess what? He's not ready to do that right now. So you got to pray, bind and loose, do all you know you need to do, and shake the dust off your feet. So the next day, never forget it. I walk in. I was like, Lord, it's going to be a good day. It's going to be a good day. He ends up coming over and just saying, hey, I apologize. I should not have had that kind of reaction. You were just the bearer, the messenger sending me the assignment to do, and you were just doing what you were told to do. And so I was like, hey, 
I forgive you and we're good, you know, but I encourage us all, right? Fight that temptation to let that flesh rise up. You know, it's like the whack-a-mole game. Beat it down with the word of God. His, his, uh, the, Lord, the Lord is a hammer. The word is a hammer, like a rock. It breaks a rock into pieces. Yeah, it's like a fire, like a hammer that breaks a rock into pieces. Jeremiah 29, 23, 29. And so uh, we've got to take it by force, you know. And then I'll share the other, right, a moment where we were in a meeting with uh, Kentucky DOT, about 30 people on the call, and someone comes in. I got this conference room reserved. So I didn't say anything, right? Y- y'all know, some of y'all know the story. All I did, I... I bit my tongue, but I had my laptop, and I just shut it a little more forcefully and got up and strolled out, and guess what happened? (sighs) The conviction set in, right? It's like, man, I controlled my tongue, but my actions. How many know our actions can speak louder and even some in the room? Mike, you all right? Because Mike normally doesn't get (laughs) frustrated. You all right? I'm like, yeah. Listen, I I held my tongue, but I shouldn't have done that. And so what do we do? We repent, right? Acts 3.19, repent. Turn to God, your sins will be forgiven. Times of refreshing will come. And then I said, Lord, give me the opportunity to make this right. And so sure enough, the next week I went over there and I was like, hey, I just want to let you know, you know, I I shouldn't have reacted that way. You know, now don't go over there and say, well, I just want to let you know I shouldn't react that way. But if you wouldn't have come in there like that, I wouldn't have done this, right? How many have done that, right? So make sure you're going over there in peace with the right motive, not to get them to apologize, but to make sure your hands are clean. And so I did that, right? I just said, hey, look, I apologize. I shouldn't have acted that way. Well, he ended up, I shouldn't have came in there like that, you know, and I was like, hey, we're good, you know, but I'm just in sharing this, you know, we're sowing and reaping. In every single moment of our lives. And that reaping is, am I reacting or am I responding, right? Am I responding in the word? Am I reacting in the flesh? And so, and it has that ripple effect. Chad, can you go to Proverbs 24? We'll start in verse 30 and I'll read through the end. I'll share this and then uh, we'll close, Lord willing, right? This is good. So I went past the field of a sluggard, past the vineyard of someone who has no sense or no self-control or they're not refining their flesh, they're not buffeting their body, they're not getting rid of these things. So verse 31, thorns had come up everywhere, the ground was covered with weeds, and the stone wall was in ruins. Think about that. You ever seen a garden? I got a garden and it's just thorns everywhere. What's that going to do? Yeah, it's going to choke. Yeah, the parable of the soils, right? No fruit. no fruit. Yeah, thank you, Wayne. So 32, I applied my heart to what I observed, and I learned a lesson from what I saw. So make sure we're learning. You know, if we've done things in the wrong, make sure we learn from it and correct it. 33, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief, and scarcity like an armed man. And so... That little slumber is, uh, I'm not going to get in the Word today. I'm tired. I'm not going to do my memory scriptures this month. I don't feel like memorizing. I'm talking to myself, right? You know, we've got to make sure we're um, taking the kingdom of heaven by force, right? I love the, the song that the Lord had given Gina to sing this month. We're fighting a battle that he's already won, but if we're not fighting it, we're not going to win, right? If I'm not fighting it, if I'm not hiding the Word in my heart, you know, walking in the fruit of the Spirit, ridding the things. I guarantee all of us probably got convicted of something today. Or maybe there's something that came into our spirit. You know what? I'll do that. I need to let go of that. If we don't make a plan to correct it, to let go of it, we're on dangerous ground. We're on shaky ground, right? A little yeast leavens the whole loaf, you know? And so you take vinegar. I don't like vinegar. You put a little vinegar on my Krispy Kreme donut. Ugh. Or anything, really. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it, mess, it can mess up the whole thing. Some of you like vinegar. No offense taken to me or you, hopefully. <laughs> but, no, we just got to make sure we're not letting a hint of the enemy come in. Amen. And so I just think it was a great day. Make sure we're hearing his voice. Don't be a goat. Be a sheep, right? Be a follower of Christ and the Word. And, and we'll be that garden that's, that's uh, flourishing, that's nourishing, you know, the fruit's coming about, and others are going to come and want to pick the fruit. Hey, how do you, why, why is your garden so fruitful? 
Why are you not getting mad when someone treats you with hate? Why aren't you talking about someone that talks about you behind their back? You know, that's an opportunity to say, hey, because I've got the Lord in me. I want to do what's right. I don't want to do as they're doing to me. I want to overcome evil by doing good. Amen. And so I just encourage us all to walk in the light, stay in the light, and be in the light. And the darkness around us will flee. Praise the Lord. If someone's offended by the darkness or the light in you, it's because they're holding on to that darkness. And don't let that, you know, change your attitude towards them. Love them. While we were yet sinners, Christ loved or died for us, you know, and that's being Christ. And that's how we distinguish the darkness, amen, by being the light. So thank you all for for being an inspiration to me and my family. I I mean, I look around and every single person I I, I learn something from, you know, and so y'all are a blessing. Thank you, everyone, joining us via YouTube as well. We love y'all, and uh, it's a great day. Anybody have anything else to share? All right, hungry? All right, get a Snickers? No, I'm playing. All right. Amen. Hunger and thirst. Yeah, he who hungers and thirsts for righteousness, he will be filled. Right? Filled with that joy, as it said in Isaiah 3.10. Tell the righteous, all's going to go well. We are going to enjoy abundant life. And so it doesn't, it's not contingent on what I face as I walk out of here, right? What's that rattle in my car now? I'm not declaring that over. So praise the Lord. The Lord's going to show me how, what I need to do. He's going to provide for me. Amen. Don't let it steal your joy. Praise the Lord. All right. Love y'all. I'll, I'll close this in prayer. Lord, we just thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, that we'll be followers of your word, Lord, that we will truly seek you first in all things and everything else will be added unto us, Lord. I just thank you for every single person in this room, every single person watching via YouTube, Lord, that that whatever it is that, that your Holy Spirit convicted or gave revelation on that they need to correct, Lord, I just pray and declare that, that we all will make a plan to overcome the enemy, the evil in our lives, Lord. We just declare, Lord, that your word is going before us, your Holy Spirit's going before us, it's uh, leveling the mountains, Lord. It's, uh, it's going before us to give us favor with everyone, Lord. We know that even our enemies will be at peace with us, Lord, as we do your word, as we honor your word, as we lift your word higher than anything else in our lives, Lord. And so I just, I just thank you, Lord, for, for you dying for us. I thank you, Lord, for um, just all that you've done for us, for making a way for us, Lord, for revealing your plan to us, Lord. Your plan is for good and not evil. And we find that plan as we seek you with all of our heart, Lord. And so I just declare that all of our hearts are fully committed to you, Lord. That our hearts are fully committed to overcoming evil by doing good. For be, to, by, to be a light amongst the darkness around us, Lord. To truly walk faithful before you, Lord. So that one day we will hear, job well done faithful servant, Lord. And so I just thank you for anyone that may be facing something, Lord, a challenge in their life. They may be thinking, I don't know what to do. I declare that they will they will change their statement of I don't know what to do to, Lord, I know you're going to make a way. I know you're going to turn it around for good. I know you're going before me, making the rough places smooth and the crooked places straight. I know you're providing my every need that I need to fulfill your plan in my life. And I just thank you, Lord, for the joy that resides in the righteous. As it says in Isaiah 3.10, Lord, tell the righteous they will enjoy abundant life. And so, Lord, I just thank you for anyone that, that um, may, may sense they haven't been walking in righteousness, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will, will give them hope. As they get into your word, Lord, you, you're, the unfolding of your word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple You don't have to have a college degree to know what the plan of God is. You don't have to have training by a certain priest to know what the will of God is. All you have to do is seek him first, get in his word, hide it in your heart, and he starts turning everything around for good. He shows you the narrow path you need to walk on. And as you do that, you're going to enjoy that abundant life, and you're no respecter of persons, Lord. So we thank you for that. Thank you for my brothers and sisters in this room and watching via YouTube. Our brothers and sisters in India, Lord, what a blessing they are. Thank you for protecting them, providing for their every need. And I just thank you, Lord, for a great day. Thank you that we will continue to carry what we've learned out of this door, Lord, and and, and 
and just truly seek to sh- how to share it with others, Lord, that we'll have our ministry radars on, radars on at every moment, Lord, ready to share the good news, ready to share a scripture that we've hit in our heart of how it's empowered us to overcome the enemy. And so I just thank you for great testimonies being developed this week. And I just thank you, Lord, for a great afternoon at the, the nursing home, Lord. I just pray that the, the hearts of those as we go over to ministry, Lord, their hearts will be prepared to receive the word, to receive truth, and also hunger after your truth as well, Lord. And we just say, have your way the rest of this day. Bring us back together safely on Thursday night. In Jesus' name, amen.